Good afternoon, everybody. This is Jake Wynn, Director of Interpretation at the National Museum of Civil War Medicine, beginning up another one of our live streams here on the museum's YouTube channel. Really excited to have you all joining with us today. Uh, thank you so much for, for tuning in. We're going to uh, wait a few minutes here as uh, folks begin to, to join in and watch the stream with us. Uh, please feel free to use the chat function if you would like to shout out where you're watching from today. Uh, I am broadcasting live from the Clara Barton Missing Soldiers Office Museum, which is in Washington, D.C., uh, which has reopened to the public. If you're interested in visiting the Missing Soldiers Office Museum, please go on to our website, civilwarmed.org, clarabartonmuseum.org as well. And you can go in and you can fill out a form to put in a reservation request. Uh, we are currently allowing visitors uh, in on Wednesdays, Thursdays, and Fridays here at the Clara Barton Missing Soldiers Office Museum. Uh, and those have to be, those requests have to be in about 24 hours in advance uh, in order to reserve a tour. If you'd like to visit our main location, which is located in Frederick, Maryland, that's the National Museum of Civil War Medicine, uh, we are open to the public for walk-ins on Fridays, Saturdays, and Sundays, uh, as well as open for reservation requests Monday through Thursday. So if you're enjoying uh, these videos and you want to head out and actually see our museums, uh, you can do that at the museum in Frederick and here at the Missing Soldiers Office in DC. Uh, currently, we do not have the Pry House Field Hospital Museum uh, on Antietam Battlefield open to the public. Uh, we are working to get some outdoor programming out there this summer, so you can stay tuned for that. Uh, that's a brief update about where things stand for the museum. Um, today's program, very excited to be bringing it to you all, is going to be focused on a soldier who we speak a lot about uh, at the National Museum of Civil War Medicine. Now, that is a soldier named Peleg Bradford, a uh, pretty unique name. He's a soldier who serves in the 18th Maine Volunteer Infantry, uh, later becomes known as the 1st Maine Heavy Artillery uh, Regiment, and it's going to see action in uh, throughout the Civil War, but specifically during 1864 uh, in campaigns at uh, Cold Harbor, Spotsylvania, and uh, most famously at uh, Petersburg. We're going to be talking about Peleg's letters. Uh, Peleg Bradford has a fantastic collection of letters uh, that has been preserved by, in part, his family uh, and in partnership with the museum has been laid out throughout the museum exhibits in Frederick. So many of you, if you have visited the National Museum of Civil War Medicine before, you probably will have noted these letters throughout the museum because Peleg Bradford does a, a really amazing job of explaining and talking about his experience with various aspects of Civil War medical care, uh, nutrition, health, uh, but also talking about things like how health impacts morale in his letters home with his friends and family. These letters are amazing in part because Peleg, you can see it in the way he spells things. He is a very much a common man, very much a, a young soldier. He's 20 years old when he enlists in the United States Army in 1862, uh, going off in part to seek adventure as much as he is going off to save the country. And he is going to have some really fascinating insights that he is going to share with his friends and families through these letters. So today's program is going to examine these letters. We're going to look at some of these letters, going to read some of them, uh, and explore kind of Peleg Bradford's perspective on the Civil War. And I hope this gives you kind of a, a, a little bit of a teaser to come and actually read all of these letters at the National Museum of Civil War Medicine. Uh, as I mentioned before, they are throughout the exhibits and you'll be able to read them in their original, uh, with all of their original misspellings uh, and how he, how Bradford spelled some of these words is, is as interesting um, as some of the content in these letters. Uh, and this is a really fascinating story uh, because of Bradford's experiences, both in combat, in hospital, in camp, uh, in the forts of Washington, DC, his story is really, a good way to look at the Civil War, medical aspects, and the common soldier and their experience during the war. So I see folks tuning in already in the uh, in the chat section. We've got Barbara watching. Thank you so much for tuning in, Barbara. I know you're here for many of our live streams and videos. Uh, we also have Louisville, Kentucky 
watching as well. Thanks for tuning in with us. Uh, you can support these videos by becoming a member of the National Museum of Civil War Medicine. You'll find that in the description of the video as well as in the chat section. Uh, if you'd like to become a member and support these videos, support the museum, you get lots of great perks as well. You can also give us a thumbs up, subscribe to the channel. That allows you to see more content like this. Join in in more of our live streams, which we try to conduct a live stream or a premiere about once a week. Um, we're going to be continuing to do that even as we continue our reopening process across our museums. So with all of that being said, let's turn it over to our presentation. I'm going to uh, throw up our um, uh, presentation here in just a second. Let me pull this up. I am always pretty bad at bringing up share screen. There we go. Uh, all right. And we head into our presentation. So as mentioned before, these letters are included in the displays at the National Museum of Civil War Medicine. So for those of you who have visited before, you've probably seen some of these letters, um, but what I'm excited about is to kind of bring them into a presentation format. Looking to speak here for about uh, 25 to 30 minutes, a little bit about these letters, about what they tell us about Civil War medicine and why they are an important aspect uh, of looking at the Civil War, Civil War medicine and the common soldier. So Peleg Bradford, this is a photograph of him from the family, the Bradford family collection that they have generously shared with us uh, to include in these exhibits and in programs about Peleg Bradford. Uh, he was uh, 20 years old when he enlisted in the United States Army in 1862. Uh, he's going to join with the 18th Maine Volunteer Infantry Regiment. Uh, that unit is going to be more famously known as the 1st Maine Heavy Artillery. Uh, and that unit uh, will get that moniker because most of what Bradford and his comrades are going to be doing for 1862 1863 and early 1864, they're not going to be out on campaign with the Army of the Potomac. They're not going to be out on campaign with any of the other uh, U.S. Army organizations in the Washington area. They are instead going to be among the units garrisoning the dozens of forts defending Washington, D.C. Uh, and so Bradford is not going to have that taste of Civil War combat until 1864 that many of his uh, comrades and other units within the US Army in this theater of the war are gonna experience at places like Antietam, uh, Fredericksburg, Chancellorsville, Gettysburg. Bradford is going to miss uh, and his comrades in the 18th and then the first main heavy artillery are gonna miss those engagements because they're gonna be the ones defending the nation's capital. Uh, and so through that, Bradford's going to experience uh, the camp life aspect uh, of, of Civil War medicine. Something that we talk a lot about at the museum is not just the battlefield medicine aspect of medical care during the conflict, but also about how diseases were treated and also about how soldiers dealt uh, with some of these diseases as well. Uh, and so he's going to talk about this in some of his, uh, in some of his letters. Uh, he's going to talk about uh, his sickness. He's going to talk about disease. He's going to be talking about how that impacted the men of his unit. Uh, and so as we go through today's program, I'm going to look at some of these letters. I'm going to read some of them to you and talk a little bit about what they, what they are saying. In some cases, the letters, of course, are speaking for themselves, and some will add a little bit of context. Uh, so this is written shortly after Bradford is going to join up with the 18th Maine. They're going to find themselves in Washington, D.C. as the Antietam campaign in September of 1862 is raging in Maryland. He's going to arrive in Washington amid the chaos uh, of what is going uh, on uh, in the aftermath of the Second Battle of Bull Run, tens of thousands of casualties being brought into Washington Civil War Hospital. And this is going to be Bradford's first uh, example uh, of what military life it's going to be like. And he's going to be stationed first at Fort de Russy, which is located in northwest Washington, D.C., in the heights uh, to the north of, of the city and what is now Rock Creek Park. Uh, and he writes this on September 18th, 1862 to his sister. Uh, and he describes army life. He says, quote, our living is hard bread and beef one day and the next is beef and hard bread. But we go out we go out in it and get peaches and apples, beehives and young pigs and cabbage and bring them in and have a good feast. After we chop trees, 10 days, we have 40 cents a day extra. So that makes for pretty good pay. Uh, so he describes a little bit of his food, his nutrition 
that he is getting while he has joined the army. And that nutrition is going to be important for Bradford. You can see here by the numerous hat clips uh, that Bradford has on his on his uh, on his cappy there. He is a big guy. He's six foot two. A uh, very healthy uh, young man from, from Maine, weighed nearly 200 pounds at enlistment. So he is a big, muscular guy. So a lot of food he is going to be uh, requiring to continue his, uh, to continuing his service. About a month later, he's going to be writing another letter, this time to his mother. Uh, and he writes a little bit about the disease and its ravages in the camp of the 18th Maine Volunteer Infantry. He says, quote, dear mother, I went and got my miniature taken. That would be the photograph. Uh, very well could be this photograph. Uh, I thought that you would like to see it. We have to drill six hours a day. I suppose you have cold weather down east now, but out here it is warm as a summer's day. There has been 16 men died out of this regiment since we have been out here. And that would be about a month at that point. Uh, about half of them died with measles. I think I have got all the letters that you have wrote for they come all in a pile. He signs that from your son, Peleg Bradford Jr. Uh, Bradford himself is going to come down with measles, which was an extremely common disease in the camps of the American Civil War. Of course, at this time, uh, not a lot of knowledge about how diseases are spread, how those diseases are functioning, uh, and how you can adequately treat these diseases. So uh, Bradford and many other thousands and millions of Civil War soldiers are going to experience these diseases, in uh, many cases, childhood diseases that they weren't necessarily exposed to. Uh, Bradford grows up in rural Maine. He's not exposed to things, and his comrades are not exposed to things like measles uh, in the way that soldiers who emerged from cities like New York or Boston would have been exposed to some of these diseases. So this is going to be very, very problematic for these soldiers. And it has an impact on them, not just in terms of their health but also in terms of the way that they viewed army life and the way that they viewed morale. Uh, and so because of the uh, common occurrences of diseases, especially in camps and forts, like the ones uh, that Bradford is gonna be experiencing, this is a, a photograph taken at Fort Totten here in Washington, showing uh, one of the forts uh, that ringed the city of Washington, and they were makeshift encampments adjacent to those forts. I'll uh, give a shout out here to one of my good friends and amazing colleagues uh, who has done great work to share the story of the Civil War defenses of Washington, uh, to Steve Fan. Uh, if you want to learn more about the incredible history around Washington's forts, definitely check out Civil War defenses of Washington on Facebook and make sure you visit some of those sites when you come here to Washington. But uh, the soldiers who are in these, uh, in these forts, their life is pretty dull. Um, there are not a lot of uh, occurrences in and around these forts in 1862 and 1863 and early 1864, the whole time that Bradford and his comrades are going to be serving in these forts. Instead of facing uh, the, the fearful uh, enemy combat, uh, facing down Confederate armies and soldiers, these men are facing the ravages of disease and also of boredom uh, and dealing with trying to keep their morale up uh, in these forts, in these camps. And throughout his letters, Bradford in writing home is going to talk about some of these issues. He's going to be talking about the morale issue. He's going to be talking about his experiences as a soldier, which up until 1864 are pretty out of the norm in terms of soldiers within the U.S. Army in the vicinity of Washington. He is not going to be out in active campaign service. He is going to be in the encampments in Washington facing disease, uh, facing that boredom. And so he's going to start writing about this. He's going to write home about his feelings about the army. This is an example he wrote from Fort Ripley on February the 2nd, 1863. And he writes about an experience that he had back in September of 1862 during the Maryland campaign when he arrived in Washington amid the chaos in the aftermath of Second Bull Run. This is what he writes to his mother. He says, quote, I saw Hooker's Brigade when they crossed the Potomac last summer, and that is all I want to see of this war. There was men bareheaded and barefooted and ragged, sick and lame. They was the worst looking set that I ever saw. They was just out of the bull run fight and that sickened me of war. From your son, 
Peleg Bradford Jr. So even though he's not seeing combat, his experience of seeing men coming out of combat is so troubling uh, that he has already soured on army life. He has soured on serving within the U.S. Army. He is soured. He does not want to experience this combat himself. He has seen enough of war, and he hasn't in reality even seen it at all. He has seen the aftermath of combat because he has not yet seen the elephant himself. Another letter he's going to write from Fort Sumner in the vicinity of Washington on October 28th, 1863. So now you're seeing he's been in the forts of Washington for a full year uh, with the 18th Maine, again, rebranded as the first Maine heavy artillery. And he writes, quote, dear mother, I am very sorry to hear that Owen has enlisted, uh, but I have said all that I can to keep him from enlisting. Uh, in regards to that, that is uh, Peleg's younger brother, Owen, uh, who is 15 years of age, uh, 16 when he actually enlists in the U.S. Army against the wishes uh, of Peleg, who had been in the service already. Uh, and he's going to be, uh, Owen joins up with the Army for a number of different reasons, uh, in part because he also has an older brother, William, who is serving in the U.S. Navy. So there is a, a Bradford uh, son already in the U.S. Army. Uh, that's Peleg. And then there's another brother in the U.S. Navy. And you have this young teenage boy eager to get into the fight, Owen, who is going to join up with the first main heavy artillery in uh, Washington uh, and who is going to go into combat alongside his brother Peleg. Uh, Peleg goes on in this letter from October 28, 1863. Uh, he, he carries on saying, quote, I think that if father lets him go, that he is to blame. Uh, for money is nothing to a man's life. You tell him that he will be sorry, a sorry boy that ever enlisted. I used to think it was something great to be a soldier, but I think different now. If I was out of the army, no $400 would get me back again. That is sure. Perhaps Owen has not been used well, but he will get used worse in the army. From your son, Peleg Bradford Jr. So pretty blunt uh, description of army life and how that has made Peleg Bradford pretty bitter uh, by this point uh, in 1863, in October of 1863. So at this point, 1862, 1863, Peleg Bradford has experienced the Civil War in the defenses of Washington. That is going to change in the spring of 1864. And because in part of the nature of, of the war at that stage, in early, uh, early spring of 1864, uh, just before spring, uh, Ulysses S. Grant is going to come east and he is going to be put in charge of the United States Army. Uh, and he is going to have a mandate that all of the U.S. armies, uh, wherever they may be in Washington or elsewhere, are going to move in sync in uh, the same moment in May of 1864. That is going to lead in this theater of the conflict. Uh, that is going to lead to the battles of the wilderness, Spotsylvania Courthouse, uh, North Anna River, Cold Harbor, leading towards Petersburg. And what becomes very clear early on in what becomes known as the Overland Campaign in May and June of 1864 is that Grant and the U.S. Army need every able-bodied man that they can get their hands on. And so this is going to lead Grant to order out the garrison around Washington and send it to the front lines. And that is going to include numerous other heavy artillery units, but is going to include Peleg Bradford Jr., 22 years old at this stage, and the first main heavy artillery. They're going to go into combat for the first time at the end of the Battle of Spotsylvania Courthouse, um, and they're going to follow the Army of the Potomac as it moves uh, towards uh, a, a quite disastrous fate at Petersburg, Virginia in June of 1864. This is a, an image of uh, showing what some of the, the trenches look like at Petersburg, Virginia in June of 1864. The nature of combat has incredibly changed uh, over the, the course of Bradford's service, although he, again, has not seen any of those changes firsthand uh, from the battles of Antietam in 1862, where men are fighting by and large in, in open terrain not using field fortifications whatsoever, using the, the natural lay of the land. Uh, by 1864, combat has changed. And we see that in this photograph. And that shows trenches, field fortifications are going to become rule of the day. Uh, and in 
that case, the, the, the defenders of these kinds of fortifications out in the field of trenches are going to have numerous advantages against their attackers. They're going to be fairly protected uh, against uh, assault. And that is going to lead to uh, disastrous bloody charges as, this, uh, as, as these tactics are, are being forced to change to overcome field fortifications like this. And it is at Petersburg in 1864 that Peleg Bradford's life is going to change forever. He has experienced combat for about a month on June 17th, 1864, when he is stationed uh, at the very front of the first main uh, on the lines at Petersburg. He is going to be uh, in kind of a, uh, a, a, a front line position. Um, he's going to be stationed kind of as a as a sort of sentry, uh, as, as the very front line of the first main's uh, position. He's going to be in a, a shallow trench out in advance of the main uh, first main heavy artillery infantry line. Uh, and while he is uh, down and fixing his shoe, he had gotten a stone in his shoe, uh, he bent down to take the stone out of his shoe when all of a sudden a Confederate bullet smashes through his leg. Um, and it strikes him in the knee, shatters his leg to pieces, uh, and leaves Bradford sprawled on the ground. Uh, years and years later, Bradford's uh, grandson is going to describe uh, having talked about this with his grandfather uh, that uh, that Peleg uh, said, quote, he always said he was sure that the rebel sharpshooter had aimed for his head uh, as he was crouching down uh, and said that bullet struck his knee. Uh, Peleg said, apparently, quote, uh, that he figured he swapped his knee for his head. Uh, and so instead of being killed instantly, as would have likely happened had he been struck in the head by that mini ball, he is instead left sprawling on the ground with a uh, furiously bleeding wound from his leg. His comrades are going to bring him off the front lines. Uh, they're going to move him from the site of his wounding to a field hospital near the rear. And this is where Bradford is uh, going to be evacuated through the system that we often talk about uh, at the museum. We talk about the Letterman system, the battlefield evacuation system that is going to be put in place during the war uh, on the United States Army side. Bradford's going to go into that evacuation system. He's going to be evacuated back uh, towards City Point, Virginia. He is ultimately going to uh, be sent to a hospital uh, behind the lines where he is going to have his uh, leg amputated. Uh, his right leg will be amputated just above the knee. Uh, and Bradford is going to uh, recover fully from this, uh, from, from this amputation, uh, thankfully for him. Uh, and this gives us the opportunity to look at the aftermath uh, of one of these amputations and look at how a common soldier will perceive that. And we'll talk about his treatment. We'll talk about his recovery and recuperation. Uh, we'll talk about the thorny issue of disability and how it changes as a result of all of these bloody wounds and amputations that take place during the American Civil War. Peleg Bradford is in, uh, plays a part, a, a, a very small part, a, a common soldier's part in a changing view of disability during the American Civil War as he becomes one of the tens of thousands of amputees who are going to have to struggle to find normalcy and struggle to build a life in the aftermath of the Civil War. Uh, but that is to come. I, I want to uh, follow the, the first main uh, heavy artillery just for, for one moment to say that in a way, Peleg Bradford's experience uh, and, and being shot through the knee and undergoing an amputation may have actually saved his life, uh, which is weird to say, right? Uh, weird to say that uh, a, a soldier having a bullet go through his knee almost hit him in the head, require his leg to be amputated and removed in a field hospital during the Civil War that actually may have saved his life. But when you look at what happened to the, the first Maine the day after uh, Peleg Bradford is wounded at the front lines, you see just how uh, remarkable Bradford's experience is going to be because this is a, a, a unit that had not been sorely tested on the battlefields in its month of field service. They are a very large unit. These regiments that were enlisted uh, and created in, in 1862 uh, and garrisoned in the forts of Washington, they did suffer casualties as a result of, of disease, 
but they did not suffer battle casualties. And so that means they are still very, very large units compared to those who had been serving at the front lines for years through numerous battles. Uh, Civil War units, regiments, you can see some of them have as little as 100 men at this point in the war. A 200, 300 men is pretty common. Uh, these units, the, the heavy artillery units, are still going to be having 700 800, 900 men that they are bringing into battle. Uh, they're throwing in these regiments and Confederates are looking at these units as they're coming across and thinking their entire brigades, multiple regiments. Instead, they are just one of these heavy artillery units. And the main heavy artillery is, is one of them. They are ordered to attack on June 18th, 1864 and are going to suffer disastrous casualties. A 604 men falling. Um, one of the heaviest, if not the heaviest, uh, single regimental casualty figures in one engagement of the entire Civil War in terms of just numbers of men uh, who go into, into combat in a single engagement who are going to be uh, wounded, uh, mortally wounded, killed, or captured. So Peleg Bradford does miss out on this. His brother, Owen, survives this charge. Um, but he is going to, uh, uh, Owen is going to uh, lose his life as a result of combat later on in the, in the fight at Petersburg in October of 1864. 16-year-old Owen Bradford is going to be killed as a result of shell wounds uh, he is going to receive at, at Petersburg. Uh, so I wanted to bring that up just to say that, that this is what the first main, uh, these are Bradford's comrades and his, his family, literal kin, uh, experience at Petersburg, which is uh, among the most remarkable and horrific stories of the American Civil War. Now we'll follow Bradford as he is going to be transported back to Washington. Uh, and he is going to arrive in Washington remarkably quickly. Uh, he is going to pen his first letter to his mother uh, in the aftermath of his wounded wounding at Petersburg on June 17th, he is going to write uh, about a week later uh, from Columbian Hospital in Washington, DC. Uh, as you can see photographed here, this is uh, in Columbia Heights in Washington. Um, and he writes this letter on June 23rd, 1864. He says, dear mother, um, pull up here, dear mother, I will now try and write you a few lines to let you know how I get along. I am in bad shape now. I have lost my right leg. It was taken off the 16th of this month. Uh, that one is, is uh, he, he makes a brief typo there. It's actually the 17th that he loses his leg. Uh, it is getting along very well right now. Uh, my leg is very painful now and I can't write but very little this time. Owen was well when I saw him last. I can't write any more this time, so goodbye. I want you to send me two or three dollars. Uh, so he gets right back to business after announcing to his mother that he has lost his right leg, been amputated on the battlefield after being shot uh, by a Confederate sharpshooter. Uh, he is asking, uh, more so demanding his mother send him two or three dollars uh, to the hospital at, uh, at, at Columbian. Uh, and in these letters, which he writes many to his mother, he is also writing to uh, who he calls Dear Friend, which is a young woman named Cynthia McPherson, uh, who is a native of the same town in Maine where Peleg grew up. And they are uh, kind of boyfriend and girlfriend kind of situation. Of course, they don't have that nomenclature at the time of the Civil War. Uh, but by this time, it becomes clear through reading these documents uh, that Cynthia and Peleg had been engaged to be married. Um, and this is going to change everything. So Peleg Bradford's letters, as he is trying to describe uh, what has happened to him, how to tell his fiance that he has lost his leg in battle, uh, is going to be something that he is going to struggle with. And it becomes clear when you begin to look at his, at his letters. Um, this is what he writes at Columbian Hospital on July 13th, 1864. This is the first letter um, that he is going to write uh, to her that is contained in this collection. He may have written to her before, but this is the first letter uh, written after his wounding that survives to Cynthia. He says, dear friend, I now improve a few moments in few, mo few moments time in writing to you. I am sitting up now, but I don't know how long I can sit up. You wanted to know how my leg got along. It is getting along first rate. I am in hopes that I shall be at home by the last of next month. Oh, Cynthia, God knows how much I have suffered since I lost my leg but it is getting along first rate now. I would like to write you a good long letter, but I can't. I can only write short letters. 
So goodbye for this time. Uh, he is going to again write to her uh, a few more letters um, while he is still in this kind of uh, dangerous condition um, in the aftermath of, of his wounding. Uh, he writes again to her on August 1st. Um, and he is going to uh, recall in, the, in this letter on August 1st, uh, his first attempts at using a crutch, um, using crutches to try to get around. He has gotten up out of bed. He is trying to start rebuilding his strength, recuperating. Uh, and he describes this experience for us through this letter, which is really cool. Um, this is, it's fascinating to see this as he is getting along in his recovery. This is what he writes. He says, I've got so that I can get out of bed and stand up on one leg. It was fun to see me the other day when I was trying to walk on crutches and fell flat on the floor and I have not tried it since. It is very warm here now. It is enough to kill a man to have to lie a bed as long as I have in this hot weather. I will hardly dare to be seen when I get home with only one leg, but never mind. I lost it in a good cause. So that is pretty remarkable there. We see that he is going to be uh, talking about uh, his wounding, talking about his experience. And it is fascinating to see uh, that he is, he is kind of come around. You know, at the beginning of his service, he talks about army life as being so terrible and how horrible it was um, and how he didn't want to be in the army anymore. He'd rather be home. And now you see that after his amputation, he's coming to terms with the fact that he has lost his limb, lost a limb in the struggle, in the Civil War, while serving in the army. And so he is going to come around to thinking about this in a, in a bit of a different way, saying that he lost his leg in a good cause. Um, his perspective has changed as a result of his wounding, as a result of his uh, trying to recuperate from, from these wounds. This is also going to lead to another kind of sticky situation that is really crucial to understand when talking about Civil War amputations. And this is disability and the view of these soldiers who have been wounded severely in battle. And this is going to be something that uh, you're going to see in other letters, um, but I will say that in my experience in working with uh, primary sources from the Civil War, especially among wounded soldiers, which is kind of a specialty where I focus upon, um, sorry, wrong button there. Um, we'll go back to, uh, to Peleg here, just pull him up. Uh, Peleg's brat, Peleg Bradford's letter here is really, really remarkable because he is going to bluntly lay out kind of the, the some of the issues that these amputee, amputees are going to be facing. So in that earlier letter that I referenced, he talks about trying to adjust to life on crutches, to life without his leg, uh, falling over as he's trying to, uh, to, to learn to use these crutches, uh, how hot it was in the hospital. But what Bradford and many of his uh, comrades who find themselves in those hospitals in 1864 as they're adjusting to life after their amputation is that they're facing a country, a society that views disability very differently than we view disability today. Uh, and this is an idea, especially prominent in this age, that if you are not a whole man, if there is something uh, physically wrong with you, that you are the other, you are isolated, you are ostracized. Uh, and so all of these veterans who are surviving because of, in some ways, the miracles of Civil War medicine, they're going to be returning home and trying to figure out how do they fit back into society? Where do they fit? How will people view them? And in this letter, written on August 20th, 1864, so now uh, getting on two months after he has lost his leg, and his recovery is underway, he's still at Columbian Hospital in Washington. This is what he writes. This is what Peleg writes to his dearest friend, Cynthia, his fiance, about how he's feeling at this, at this really crucial moment. He says, quote, dearest friend, perhaps you think that I have forgotten you by not writing to you oftener, but I have not. I think of you every day, but I hope the time will soon pass away and I can be at home with you, for I shall always hold the promise that I made when I was at home last spring. But as I am now, it would be better for you to break that promise. For when I made that promise, I was a whole man, but I am far from it now. And he finishes that letter saying, yours forever, Peleg Bradford Jr. It's a heartbreaking letter, heartbreaking. Gives me chills right now reading that. Uh, he, Bradford, is concerned that Cynthia will not view him as a whole man, will have these societal views of disability, will not accept him 
And he asks her, says to her that as he is currently, as he is in the aftermath of his amputation, he is no longer a whole man and that she can break that promise and get out of this, uh, of this engagement uh, and go her separate ways. Now for uh, Cynthia, for Peleg, uh, that story, that love story does end well. Uh, they are a soldier, a soldier who returns home in 1865, Peleg, uh, and marries Cynthia, goes on to have a very happy and healthy life. I'll get to that in just a second. Um, but uh, this letter demonstrates a lot of what Civil War soldiers who suffered grievous battlefield injuries and survived faced in the aftermath of the war. Uh, their concerns uh, laid out very, very bluntly in this wonderful letter written by Peleg Bradford in August of 1864. Bradford's gonna stay at, our, uh, stay at Columbian Hospital until 1865. Uh, he's gonna continue his treatment, continue recuperation, get fitted out with prosthetic limbs, go through the whole process that many Civil War amputees are gonna go through. And he writes a, another remarkable letter at the end of the war, um, which I wanna include here as we begin to conclude uh, this formal part of the presentation. He writes it on April 7th, 1865. So four days after Richmond falls, he writes this letter and he writes it to his mother and describes the scenes in Washington uh, in the, uh, as the war is drawing to a close. He says, quote, dear mother, they have taken Petersburg and Richmond. And the report is today that they have captured old Lee's army. And they think here that the rebellion is about played out. When the news came here that Richmond was taken, they fired 800 guns and rang the bells. And you could see, you could hear them clear two miles. And at night you could see to pick up a pin in the streets, it was so light. Every street in the city was lit up in great style and every window was filled with candles and bands were playing in every direction. Your son, Peleg Bradford. So I, I love that letter, uh, giving a description of the intense party atmosphere that existed in Washington in 18, uh, April 1865 in the aftermath of Richmond falling. Two days later, uh, the Army of, uh, of Northern Virginia and Robert E. Lee surrender at Appomattox Courthouse. We don't have Bradford's uh, feelings on that in, in these letters here. Um, but surely uh, pretty excited about the war ending, but also it is tempered with uh, feelings of loss and mourning. Uh, by this point in 1865, uh, Peleg Bradford's younger brother had been killed in battle, killed at Petersburg, Virginia uh, with the first main heavy artillery. So it is with a heavy heart um, only for himself, for his lost limb, but also for uh, his, his family that he had lost a younger brother in this struggle. Uh, that Bradford is going to see the war end up close, still in Washington in 1865. So I'll just close out with uh, some items that are in the National Museum of Civil War Medicine, which you can see on display, including some photographs of Bradford, uh, as of, of Peleg and Cynthia. Uh, you'll see them here. Uh, they had eight children. Uh, they get married in 1866. Uh, they have a, a, a slew of children. Uh, and Bradford is going to do a, a number of things in the aftermath of his Civil War service. Uh, he's going to uh, be a farmer. Uh, he's going to uh, run a sawmill as well. So you can imagine in the backwoods of Maine, uh, you have this uh, uh, amputee from the Civil War hobbling around, um, getting around just fine on this peg leg uh, that we have in our collection. You can see how it was all fitted out uh, for, for Peleg. So we, in the collection of the museum, we have Peleg's peg leg. Um, and uh, it's an amazing artifact from this time to show how Civil War amputees adjusted to their new lives. In this case, this is not an army issued uh, prosthetic limb that were common and in use by thousands of Confederate or thousands of Union and Confederate uh, amputees in the aftermath of the conflict. Uh, in some cases, they do have something of their own creation that they make or, or someone that they know will make for them uh, to make their uh, more comfortable to, in, in the case of, of Peleg, having to go out and, and operate a sawmill, uh, that is gonna create unique challenges that may ne not necessarily uh, make sense to have the official army legs uh, that are gonna be given out. Uh, and we oftentimes, uh, you will also see in some of these photographs that uh, he's not necessarily using the legs, but will oftentimes use crutches to get around. So uh, from August of 1864, uh, he had gotten a lot better at using crutches and, and getting around. Uh, he is gonna live well into the, uh, into the early part of the 20th century, passes away in 1918, uh, lives a very full life. His family, very, very proud of, uh, of 
of Peleg's service in the American Civil War, save these letters, um, and thankfully are, uh, allow us at the museum to, to share uh, these stories, share these letters and what they tell us about Civil War medicine. Um, so I encourage you just in, in the end of the presentation here, formal presentation here, um, to say that uh, if you do want to read more of these letters, come and visit the National Museum of Civil War Medicine. You'll see letters in the exhibits talking about things like recruiting and enlistment and camp life, battlefield medicine and recuperation in hospitals and what Peleg experienced and how he related those experiences to his family. Uh, you can also find in our bookstore, it's not available on online yet, uh, you'll find a collection of those letters. Uh, uh, the book is called uh, No Place for Little Boys. Um, it's about Peleg's experience in some of those letters, as well as some of the recollections of Peleg's family uh, in, the, in the years after uh, the Civil War and in the years after Peleg's death in the early 20th century. All right, so thank you all so much for, for tuning in. I will end my screen share and come back over uh, to the comments section. Uh, and we'll go back through uh, questions here. Uh, good to see you all uh, have some comments and things in here and good to see 50 of you still watching with me uh, today. So thank you so much for, for tuning in. Um, if you did enjoy this video, I would say please, uh, Become a member of the National Museum of Civil War Medicine if you haven't yet done so. Uh, it's a great way of supporting the museum, supporting programs like this as well. Uh, you get cool perks too. It starts out for as, as low as $25 a year. Uh, so basically $2 a month to support the National Museum of Civil War Medicine programs like these and to make sure that these stories are told to future generations. So you can play a role in us sharing these stories. Um, so I'm gonna go back through some of these comments. If you do have any additional questions or comments, please throw those into the chat. Happy to answer any of those questions for you today. Uh, I have quite a bit more time, I have about 20 minutes to answer any questions. So if you do have them, please, uh, please throw them into the chat. Happy to, to answer and address those. Um, so I'm just going to go down through the list here. Um, Laura says, my spouse is a descendant of Peleg Bradford. We visited the museum a few years ago. Fascinating. Thank you, Laura, for coming to visit the museum. And I'm always amazed. I love those moments when we have the descendants of people whose items, their letters, uh, pieces of you know, actual artifacts uh, that when they come and visit, uh, those items with a connection to their family history. And we have it happen quite frequently. And, and with Peleg Bradford specifically, uh, family members like yourself often come into the museum and it is a delight uh, to, to meet you. Um, and if you do have other, uh, any of you out there watching right now, if you have other items uh, in your personal collections or family collections, we love to know about it. Um, even if you, you don't want to uh, you know, donate it to the museum or, or put it on loan, we love to share pictures, stories of items that may be in your personal family collections. Uh, we very strongly believe in, in collaboration, in sharing those stories because it takes letters like those written by Peleg Bradford and, and thankfully the family allowing us to share those letters and to talk about them, uh, that we can gain new perspectives about Civil War medical history, about what it was like to live in that time period. Uh, and so we are always thrilled to see folks sending in uh, pictures of items in their collection, photographs of their, uh, of their Civil War ancestors and to hear their stories. So whether they be uh, Civil War surgeons or nurses, or just the common soldiers who are out there on the front lines and experiencing Civil War medicine that way. Uh, we love to share those stories on our social media channels uh, and to bring those perspectives on board to learn more about what it was like to live through that era. Uh, we have David Hogan here. Hello from Forestville, Maryland, just outside of Washington, DC, and Todd from South Carolina, Rosemary in Ann Arbor. Hello to y'all. Thank you all so much for tuning in. Uh, St. Louis, Missouri watching, uh, as well as Southwest Washington State. Uh, we got Wayne, in the uh, surgeon with the third New York Light Artillery. Thank you all so much for, for tuning in with us today. Uh, Tamara in Memphis, Tennessee. Hi, Tamara. Thanks for tuning in with us today. Uh, Barbara Schultz, do you know if he got a disability pension and how much it was? That is a great question. I don't actually have that on hand here, um, whether or not he received a disability pension. I would wager that he most likely did as it was very common for amputees to get those very uh, comparatively easy uh, for, uh, for amputees to get uh, disability pensions in the immediate aftermath of the war. Uh, but it was not something that uh, 
that Bradford was dependent upon, he did uh, a remarkable job of recovering from his wounds and did, uh, again, make a quite a prosperous career in the aftermath of, of his wounding and doing some very physical labor, in part with the help of, uh, of all his eight kids as well. Um, but I would say, I, I don't know that for sure, Barbara, I can look into that, I can add it into the uh, uh, comment section at the end of the video. Um, but I would say that I, I believe I remember that he does get uh, a, a pension, but I will confirm that and drop it into the chat. Um, right, uh, talking, going through these, some of these questions. Oh, thank you, uh, Dog Lover 2020. Uh, I think this is wonderful. Do more presentations like this. We appreciate it um, and uh, appreciate you tuning in uh, and, and watching. Um, Brian Swan, do you intend to digitize the collection of Peleg's letters? Um, that is uh, not something that, that we can do. That is a decision of the family. And I believe they may have at this point uh, contributed that to a, an academic institution, um, donated it, uh, those letters. Um, but you can find the, the letters in print form. Uh, we do sell them at the National Museum of Civil War Medicine store. Again, they're not on our online store yet. We are expanding that store online, um, but you can also find it on uh, various online retailers. I'll leave it at that. Uh, if you look up the book, um, No Place for Little Boys and search Peleg Bradford, you'll find uh, these letters. Um, you'll find uh, it is a remarkable collection um, that the family has. And again, very, very thankful um, that they have shared those with us. Um, and we have Thomas saying, uh, for, uh, watching from Mechanicsburg, PA, and Barbara saying thanks. Um, that brings an end to, uh, to our questions here. Um, and I want to thank you all so much for, for tuning in. If you do have any other questions, um, we'll be able to ask to answer some of those in the comments um, afterwards. So feel free to continue to contribute those to the comments section. I uh, want to thank you all so much for tuning in. If you have not yet become a member of the museum or donated to the museum, this is where I'm going to say, you can go ahead and do that now. You'll get lots of cool perks, get to hear the latest research, um, get to come to events. If you're living in the DC area, get to come to events uh, exclusively and for free. So we have lots of walking tours or we're getting in back into in-person programs in the future. Uh, please uh, contribute and you will become a part of this. You help us. We are a member supported institution. So if you like these videos, um, please contribute and you will help to support these videos in the future. We are going to continue these video programs even once we go back to full normal operations, uh, which we anticipate in the next couple of months. Um, we are very excited to, to get back to some normalcy at the, at the museum, uh, but we are we have built a, a, a wonderful online audience. It's so great to have you all watching with us. Uh, we're really excited about continuing to bring these videos to you. So you'll be directly helping to support us, upgrade our technology, uh, new equipment, um, and we will be able to contribute to, uh, to YouTube uh, more videos uh, like this, more programs like this, and sharing these really important stories. I uh, have another question in here uh, from Todd. Uh, for how long did the military hospitals around Washington operate after April 6, 1865? Did they eventually transfer patients to civilian hospitals? That's a really great question, Todd, and one that I'm excited to say that we're going to have a video coming out on uh, pretty shortly about some of the Washington uh, Civil War hospitals. Uh, most of them are going to operate until the summer of 1865, um, get to August and September. Uh, then the hospitals will close, uh, their patients will be mostly sent home, um, and their, the hospitals will actually be deconstructed. Um, they will be torn down, uh, their, their equipment will be sold for scrap, uh, the wood in many of these hospitals, most of them were, were uh, frame uh, buildings, wood frame buildings, uh, will be torn down um, and will be sold as lumber. Um, and medical equipment will go to universities, will go into private uh, hands. Uh, the hospitals in Washington and elsewhere in the war zone are almost all going to be torn down. Uh, and there will not be, in many cases, civilian uh, hospitals that will be constructed until a few years later, um, as this kind of new ideology around Civil War hospitals, uh, around uh, the fact that those hospitals were so successful at saving patients and treating them in centralized locations with organized ambulances, uh, that in the years after the Civil War, civilian hospitals will begin to, to be developed. But for the most part, those hospitals are not located where the Civil War hospitals were located. We're not in the same buildings uh, because most of the, the, the military hospitals are torn down after the war. 
Uh, all right. Well, thank you all so much um, for tuning in with us. Uh, hit that like button if you've enjoyed the video. Subscribe to our channel. Become a member. Click that link. Become a member of the National Museum of Civil War Medicine. It's been a delight uh, being with you all today. Uh, great way to start the week. Uh, we will be sharing a blog post later this week about Peleg uh, with more of these letters uh, and some more photographs on the anniversary of his wounding on June 17th. So stay tuned for that. Uh, follow us on our other social media networks and you'll see that. Uh, but we'll be back next week uh, for a premiere of a video about military hospitals in the Antietam campaign in 1862 with historian, uh, medical historian, Dr. Gordon Dahman. So stay tuned for that. We have many, many more videos to come. Very excited to bring them all to you. But thank you so much for tuning in and we will see you next time. Have a great day, everybody.